I'm excited to be talking with Ananda Thomas, who is working with Fix SAPD. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking today about the petition effort that is currently underway and uh, just asking her to let folks in the community know more about that petition, um, kind of what the stakes are, what the goals are, um, and just, yeah, hear more about kind of the, some of the deeper issues involved and how people can assist if, they, if they're moved to do so. So uh, Ananda, thank you very much for coming and um, talking with us today. And um, yeah, if you want to just maybe start by telling us a little bit about this petition effort, how did it get started, who started it, and, um, yeah. and why? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited about this. Uh, let's see, we are a grassroots organization, uh, really started and was ignited after you know the protests and uprising after the death of George Floyd and death of Breonna Taylor as well. Uh, Ojiami uh, Martin is our founder. Um, it's pretty funny because the first time she actually pitched this idea uh, was a community meeting I was hosting. And it just sounded something that was so far out there and I didn't fully understand that I actually kind of brushed it aside. But uh, she persisted and suddenly, you know, it all made sense. She got her materials together. But we've been going since about June of this summer. Um, it's been a lot of work, a lot of uh, sweat <laughs> and some long nights, but um, yeah, we just started launching our petitions live about two weeks ago, heading into early voting with a lot of steam, um, and really just trying to take down some of these barriers to accountability that exist by state law. You know, letting our citizens of San Antonio decide what a police what police accountability should look like, and policing in San Antonio, taking it into our own hands. Mm -hmm. And so, what? Um Tell me more about the petition goals, like the substance of the petition, right? So I know, I understand that you're targeting two state chapters, right? Um, 143 and 174. What is the significance of those two state laws for police violence in San Antonio? Yes. So uh, chapter 143 uh, specifically deals with police accountability. So um, things like setting uh, statute of limitations on discipline, um, you can't discipline an officer for misconduct if it's after six months after the incident. Mm -hmm. And so that's dangerous because sometimes these processes take a long time mm -hmm. that it might hit seven months and suddenly you can't discipline this officer. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it wasn't discovered till past this six month window, even if it is a super egregious act. Um, so we have the incident of Matthew Luckhurst. Uh, he was an officer who fed a feces sandwich to a homeless man. Mm. Um, by the time all the disciplinary processes were happening, it was seven months after the incident. Yeah. So he could no longer be fired for that. Um, or have the, you know, that's why, the, I'm sorry, the police chief tried to fire him. Mm -hmm. By the time everything was done, it was seven months after that. So he was bar brought back through an arbitrator who pointed that out. 143 is what disqualifies anonymous complaints. So whether you're an officer or a citizen, by this state law, your name has to be on the complaint and that officer has access to it, which mm -hmm. is dangerous. Yeah. Um, most importantly, it's what sets up arbitration. So 78% of our officers in S San Antonio in the past 10 years that have been fired have been brought back through arbitration. We have officers that are on their third, fourth, fifth arbitration mm. um, and you know that's just really dangerous because it's a set of precedent and a pattern of behavior where these officers know they can get away with this type of behavior and get their jobs back often with back pay mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the dangers of chapter 143 okay. 174 deals specifically with collective bargaining rights mm -hmm. it's what allows our police union contract to supersede any of our local laws or civil service commission, um, any county laws, anything that we have here. So it really um, makes this lopsided co like collective bargaining agreement, right? Where whatever the police union's concerns are, they trump our own public safety concerns as a city. Right. Um, and so what we're really working to do is to repeal these laws so we can rewrite the whole the whole thing, what public safety looks like. Mm -hmm. um, basically, by repealing 174, the police union contract would stay in 
effect through October 2021, because that's what it's set to do. And then the city and the police union would have to come together to rewrite a whole new contract, Mm -hmm. um, which wouldn't have to fall under these laws, right? Mm -hmm. 143 or 174. So it can have every single accountability piece we need, Mm -hmm. but also just give us an even plain field when Mm -hmm. we're doing these types of negotiations. Right. So it really kind of would return more power to the community to be able to say what policing looks like in San Antonio. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So what, um, I mean, how would that then affect, would that affect any other kinds of collective bargaining rights for other unions in the city? Yeah, so um, this is only focused on the San Antonio Police Officers Association, SAPOA um, is how we say it's shortened, um, because it's specifically in our petition language. It says police officers. It does not affect any other collective bargaining rights or unions. Mm-hmm. We're pro, you know, labor rights, pro unions. But I mean, nationally and locally, you can often find a divide between, for instance, the AFL CIO and what our police officer associations do. Mm -hmm. Um, And most labor unions or all, any labor unions really, you know, IBEW, um, AFSCME, they do protect, you know, the benefits and rights of their workers, but they also protect a sense of morality. At the end of the day, if a member commits an egregious act or something unlawful, they don't fight for them to get their jobs back because it was illegal, it was immoral. But that's not what we're finding that SAPOA is doing through arbitration. They're bringing back officers that, um, you know, tamper with evidence, that have been abusive to other officers, have been abusive to citizens, have been abusive to their own family members, Mm -hmm. use racial and derogatory slurs, the types of things that no other type of union or employer, for that matter, would keep somebody on their staff for. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're seeing yeah. So it's really kind of governing, you know, these two chapters are really, it, it's it's not really about working conditions. It's about kind of um, these things that are outside of working conditions, which are what collective bargaining is supposed to focus on, right? And instead it's protecting these other things that have nothing to do with working conditions, right? Um, and then what would San Antonio look like without the presence of those two chapters? Yeah, so we actually have a great example here in Texas. Dallas does not have chapters 143 or 174. Um, Their police officers are well paid. They have great benefits. Um, They actually meet under what's called meet and confer instead of collective bargaining. So both um, the city and their officers association are actually meeting at an even playing field. And, you know, the city has a lot more control over public safety budget. The citizens have a lot more say over what policing looks like in their community. Um, You have better accountability measures. It's, you know, easier to fire a bad officer, you know, that does commit multiple acts of misconduct, right? They can actually stay off the force. The police chief says that they don't want this officer on the force. That's it. If the city says they don't want this officer on the force, that's it. Um, And that's just not what exists here. But we can get to that by repealing these laws. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me, um, give us some information, just kind of like the technical specs, right, Um, with this petition. Like, how many signatures do you need? Um, By when do you need them? What is triggered legally when you hit that number of signatures? And then when is it when would it actually go to ballot? Right. So um, they're a little different. 174 requires 20,000 signatures. 143 requires about 79,000 signatures. Um, Our goal is to get 150,000 signatures total. Uh, We need to turn them in by the beginning of February to get them on the ballot for May 2021. Mm -hmm. They have to be um, brought in through a ballot initiative because that's how they were brought in back in the day. And that's what was stated. Mm -hmm. Um, And it has to be a municipal election Mm -hmm. because that's what they were voted in on. Okay. The next feasible one is May 2021. Plus, we know that we're going to have, um, you know, we have a couple of council members that are terming out. It's uh-huh. going to be a contentious mayor's race. So we're going to have a lot of voters. Yeah. And it seems like the best um, chance. But the goal is 150,000. 
any kind of petition drive, there's going to be a signature threshold. Maybe somebody signed twice. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they had illegible handwriting or put the wrong voter address down. So there's going to be some of those signatures that are going to be invalidated and we need a cushion. Right, right. Exactly. Um, yeah, I would say the only other technical thing is unfortunately due to city charter, we cannot do this online. We would have to amend the city charter for it. So it is all in-person paper signatures. Um, that is a battle that we would like to take up at some point, um, but we wouldn't be able to take up currently and also do our petition drive now. So um, it is in person. They're paper ballots. You can download the petition online. They do need to get notarized. So whatever signatures you collect, you have to notarize the paper and then return to us. Mm -hmm. But we're going to be out at all um, as many polling locations as we can during early voting and election day. We'll be canvassing, holding petition drive through events to be COVID friendly. Mm -hmm. um, so really just encouraging people to be on the lookout. Um, even if you're on the fence about this, um, all you're doing by signing the petition is saying that you would like to see it on the ballot in May. So San Antonio can revisit these laws. Right, right. Um, they were brought in decades ago and mm -hmm. haven't been revisited since. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's really time to give San Antonio a voice and a choice. This is something that's up in the public sphere. Personally, for most of us in San Antonio, for instance, Chapter 143 was brought in in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. We would not be able to vote on that. Uh, that was before the Voting Rights Act. Oh, yeah. Um, even 174. Yeah. So, and that's not what San Antonio, I mean, San Antonio is a very diverse city. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, especially because there are so many communities here that are affected by police brutality and racism and you know, you know, other accountability measures that we really should be able to vote on these again. Yeah, for sure. Um, beyond signing the petition, um, are there other kinds of, you know, what are your biggest needs or your biggest calls to action to the community? Do you need donations? Do you need um, certain kinds of volunteer assistance? Do you need notaries to volunteer? Um, tell us a little bit more about that. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, you really hit the nail on the head there. Um, this is grassroots as it gets. Um, our board members, of course, are, are, are all volunteers that are very, very passionate. Um, but we really need these boots on the ground to collect these signatures. Um, it is a five month window. It is a lot of signatures. Not saying that it's impossible because we have seen petition drives. Mm -hmm. um, that have gotten far more signatures in a shorter window. But we need people to help us collect signatures. Anybody can do it. We do need notaries, volunteer notaries, to help us notarize these petitions. Um, currently for early voting, right now, this is a big opportunity. If we can have a, you know, a whole community of volunteers at every polling location and get 10 to 15 signatures an hour, we can actually hit 100,000 signatures by election day. Mm -hmm. But we can't do that without volunteers. We can't do that without volunteer notaries. So please, 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 you can go to fixsapd.org, sign up to volunteer. We do trainings twice a week virtually um, on how to circulate petitions. And then, of course, any nonprofit always needs donors as well. Um, we're trying to get a paid petition program going, um, you know, merchandise, supplies just to have water snacks ppe um kits for all of our volunteers and paid petitioners social media ads um we're going up against a powerful officers association um we know that they're going to be spending some money in false narratives against us so being able to push out the, our own narratives and truths and the data that we have to back it up it, it takes resources and money. So um, please go to fixsapd.org. There's a wealth of information of how to get involved on there. Cool. Awesome. Um, and just to kind of end with a more, you know, a bigger kind of more philosophical question, you kind of alluded to this already a little bit um, in terms of the responses you've gotten or that you anticipate. Um, can you talk to me about the decision of your coalition to focus on police accountability? Um, mm -hmm. you know, versus redistribution of funding or, you know, what people call defund or, or even the bigger vision of, of abolition. Um, what does kind of this more very targeted, very pragmatic strategy make possible? 
Um, and then in what ways might it be limited as well? Um, you know, if we're, if we're coming at this from a desire to see really deep structural transformations, systemic transformations in these centuries long histories of white supremacy that are showing up in institutions of policing, right? So I would imagine, you know, some people are, um, some people are gonna say, oh, what you're proposing is too scary, it's too radical, like you wanna get rid of police. Uh, and then some might be saying, well, you know, that this is too incremental, it's too gradual, it's too, um, it's too reformist, you know, we want to, we, we, it's not enough, right? So how do you, right. how do you navigate that? Well, um, truly, there's, these laws are serious barriers, no matter what you want to do. I mean, we as an organization are not about defunding the police, but for the community that is, and this recent battle over the budget, you know, 86% of the public safety budget, of the police budget is under the contract. That means you can't touch that. Yeah. Out of the $487 million, there's $101 million that was wiggle room that the community or city council could actually mold. And even then, there's still a lot of city contracts and things that cover that. The repeal of 174 and rewriting a collective bargaining agreement, which would actually be meet and confer, but a new contract mm -hmm. could change that, could allow you to have more pull in your hands on this money and where it goes and how it's distributed more. Yeah. It can change what training looks like, what hiring looks like, what firing looks like, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, everything that's in that contract, which has serious accountability measures and affects the size of the police force, that's covered by 174. Mm -hmm. um, people are talking about ending qualified immunity. That's 143. Mm -hmm. That's, that's arbitration. Mm -hmm. That's this, statute of limitations on discipline that's only being able to look so far back on an officer's record. Yeah. That's these laws. So, um, you know, no, I think it, no matter what level of change it is or where you think the changes need to be made, mm -hmm. it's all in the contract and it's in these laws. And until they're repealed, you really can't train change any of that. So there's many steps <laughs> I think that we need to reform. But this is the first major step to break down barriers because there's, I mean, we have an action right now by, by our city council, by our city leaders, even our state and national leaders. But ha most of that is because there are laws like this in place. And they're not just here. They're all around the country. Mm -hmm. And so for us, this is truly the starting point to reform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then what about for folks, you know, who might be on the other side and say like, um, you know, I, I support what you do, or, you know, I would also like to see less police violence, but I don't know, like, you know, defund the police, that's too, that's, that's scary, you know, I don't, I, I, I can't go there. How, you know, how are you responding to those folks as well? Yeah, so there are, I know a lot of folks, for instance, were worried, well, what about police benefits? They need to be taken care of. There are other laws in place that protect police officer pensions, their benefits. Chapter 147, for instance, is one of those. So our police officers will still be taken care of. But really, at the end of the day, we know that bad officers are just as dangerous for our good officers as they are for citizens. You know, these are the officers that are giving abusive language and derogatory slurs towards their other officers. Mm -hmm. um, these are the type of officers that when an officer, a good cop, complains or intervenes, you know, sends in a report, these are the types of officers that follow them around or don't show up for their backup. That's an officer's life right there. So this is about taking care of our officers as well as our community, no matter what side you're on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Dallas doesn't have these laws and their officers are better paid than ours. They also have more officers per capita. Mm -hmm. So if that's something that you believe in, that's still something that can be done by repealing these laws and saying, hey, we're gonna take, we're just gonna take this back, accountability and policing back in our own hands mm -hmm. and rewrite what it looks like mm -hmm. because it hasn't been rewrote in decades. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the end of the day, if you think that this is something that needs to be revisited, no matter what side you're on, mm -hmm. no matter what you want, more police, less police, uh, more funding, less funding, better training, different training, 
we can't do that until these laws are repealed. Mm -hmm. And if you think that San Antonio should get a choice on this, sign the petition and vote in May, no matter how you feel on this. Mm -hmm. Um, A bare facts poll recently said 65% of San Antonians find the police union to be a barrier to accountability. Mm -hmm. Everybody agrees that there are accountability issues, no matter what side of the fence you are on. Um, And, the barrier has been identified, not just by us, but by San Antonians too. Yeah. So yeah, now's the time. Yeah. Any final things that you uh, want to say you didn't get to say or um, last thoughts you wanted to share? Um, I just want to encourage everybody, please visit us at fixsapd.org. Get signed up to help us during early voting. Um, like I said, we have the ability just by election day to hit 85% of our goal, but we can't do it without you. We need notaries. We need circulators. We need funders. Uh, if you want to walk around through your neighborhood and go door to door, um, please reach out to this, us. This is a grassroots effort. Um, you know, we know that change and reform isn't easy, but this has been identified as the biggest step.